it over to you. Go ahead. Okay, great. So, well, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Miriam Locke, and I'm excited to chat you, with you all today and introduce myself to the community. I am very excited to join you all at South Lake Tahoe. Um, just a quick bit about me. I'm originally from south of Boston in Massachusetts. Um, I went to Vassar College in New York for my undergrad. I then went to University of Louisville in Kentucky for med school and trained at Mount Sinai in Manhattan for my urology residency. Um, for the past four years, I've been working here in California in Fairfield at David Grant Medical Center in the Air Force, and now I'm excited to join you all. So recurrent urinary tract infections, why do we care about them? Well, these are one of the most common bacterial infections that we see and the most common uh, infection that occurs in the hospital. Um, it's one of the most common reasons that I see patients in my office. So urinary tract infections account for greater than 10 million visits with a doctor per year, over 100,000 100, hospitalizations a year, and around $2 billion in healthcare costs per year. So a pretty significant um, disease process that affects the, our community across the country. So a couple of definitions for you, because when we think about infections, you know, we get a culture and there's bacteria and automatically we think we need antibiotics and it has to be treated. Well, um, not always true. So there's something called asymptomatic bacteriuria. And what that is, is where some patients may be colonized with bacteria in their urine, but it's not causing any symptoms. So for a woman, that means that it's in two samples. And for a male, that means it's in one. Women, we get two because it's a little bit harder for us to give a, a clean catch at, compared with a guy. Um, and again, these patients don't have any symptoms. It's just if you're checking a urine culture for some other reason that it might be found. Cystitis is the syndrome of symptoms, meaning that you're having that burning when you pee. You have to go to the bathroom frequently. You have to run to the bathroom. You might have that pain above your pubic bone in your belly um, that you feel like you need to empty yourself. And that does not always mean that you have an infection. And uh, I think that's something that brings a lot of people to my office and they expect me to say, oh yeah, we have to start you on antibiotics. And unfortunately, I think I upset them when I say that's not the case. There are other things that can cause that. Antibiotics aren't always the answer. A UTI or urinary tract infection is technically when you have a greater than a certain amount of bacteria in your urine or this 100,000 uh, colony forming, forming units per milliliter. When you catch your urine midstream, meaning you pee in the toilet, then you put the cup there, the rest, and, and that's how we collect your sample. Um, studies have shown that it doesn't have to reach that threshold, that some women are symptomatic with lower counts, so we do treat those patients now. And again, you have those syndromic symptoms. You have to run to the bathroom. You have pain when you pee, malodorous urine. And then pyelonephritis is when that infection goes up to your kidneys. And that's when it can cause significant damage to um, your body. So it can cause renal dysfunction if we don't treat it. Um, and that's when you may have back pain, fever, um, both UTIs and pyelonephritis. You can have blood in your urine. Um, some more definitions. So when we think about urinary tract infections, we kind of break it down into two groups, complicated and uncomplicated. Uncomplicated UTIs are a healthy female patient. They have no anatomical issues. Um, and that's because it's a lot easier for females to get back, get these infections. Our urethra are, you know, three inches long, two to three inches. Um, bacteria can get in there quite easily and it's much easier to treat. A complicated UTI, any male patient who has an infection, it's considered complicated, patients who are immunocompromised, and then patients who have structural abnormalities. So you can see here, this is a urinary tract. We have our kidney, our ureter, which is what drains the urine from the kidney to the bladder, the bladder and your urethra. Um, so some patients may have more than one ureter. Uh, some patients' bladder doesn't empty well. You can have kidney stones. All of these things make it so it's a more complicated picture. And that those two definitions really dictate how I recommend treating patients, the length of an antibiotic course that we give, 
um, and the type of antibiotic that I might consider. Um, so then when what we're here for today, recurrent UTIs, uh, so technically to be defined as having recurrent UTIs, that's two culture proven infections within six months or three within a year. Um, so sometimes I'll have patients who say, oh, I have recurrent urinary tract infections and I look in their chart and maybe in the past five years they've had two. Uh, it's, believe me, not fun to have a UTI and I completely understand that, um, but it doesn't always mean that you meet this diagnosis. So how do we test for it? Um, oftentimes you'll go to the office or an urgent care and we collect a urine. And typically somebody comes back really quickly and says, well, it looks like you might have an infection. Well, first in the office, we can take your urine sample, put it into a machine and really quickly we get results that tell us that there's markers for infection, which are Luke esterase, that there's nitrates in it. That's when certain bacteria convert nitrate, which is in your urine into nitrate. That's never normal. So that's something that we look for. We may see red blood cells and that all comes on a strip of paper. That's um, not proving that you have a UTI. That's showing that you have symptoms or markers that may suggest you have an infection. And so oftentimes we'll treat based off of that. Um, just something to note that pyridium or phenazopyridine, it is a treatment that we give to patients when they're having burning when they pee. It's that medicine that turns your pee bright orange. It isn't a lot of those azo tabs that you can get over the counter in the pharmacy. It can cause a false positive for um, nitrates on a urinalysis. So that does sometimes cloud the picture for clinicians. So after we get that quick test back, we then send that urine for culture. And that's really what tells us if you have a urinary tract infection or not. We want to see, is it growing bacteria? And if so, what bacteria is it growing? And what antibiotics is that bacteria sensitive to? And that is key. And the, our um, American Urologic Association guidelines say that that's required for every single symptomatic event. That also helps me counsel you in the future. If you come in and you say you've had five infections over the past six months, and I can't see any of those results because they're not in the computer, I can't guarantee that you've truly had infections. So from my standpoint, that's really important. So how do UTIs happen? There's kind of two steps involved with getting infected, adherence and internalization. And so just a kind of a sideline, most of the studies on urinary tract infections do focus on E. coli because they account for the majority of infections. So 85% of uh, infections that you get in the community and 50% that you would get in the hospital. So adherence, that's how the bacteria get into the bladder. So in a female, they may be within the vagina um, and they can get up into the, they get through this, you know, over the skin into that urethral opening, and then they go up along the mucosa into the bladder. Again, that's why it's so much easier for a female to get an infection rather than a male, just the proximity, unfortunately, of our urethra to the vagina and to the anus. Um, the bacteria have these pili that help them kind of stick to the wall of the bladder. And there are two pathogenic types that we know about type one, which again, allows adherence to the bacterial wall. And that does involve uh, demanosylated uh, um, receptors. And then P-type, which again, allows adherence actually up into the kidney. And that is what helps um, certain bacteria cause pyelonephritis. And those are mannose resistant. So uh, I mentioned that because in the future or later in this talk, I'll talk about some of the things that we recommend that may help prevent infections and D-manos is one of them. Again, um, these bacteria can get adhere to the vagina. They can get there from fecal incontinence. Um, spermicidal agents actually kill the good bacteria and make it so this bad bacteria can overgrow. So it, while it is important for certain things, it may make you more prone to urinary tract infections. Then of course, we all know that any indwelling catheter or any foreign body, it always puts you at risk of infection. They can, I expect them to become colonized. Um, e. coli uh, can really bind well to the vagina as well as your oral mucosa. 
Um, and there have been studies that show that women who get recurrent urinary tract infections may actually be more prone to them, that there may be a genetic component that allows these bacteria to adhere better to those patients. Um, and again, as I mentioned, there's good bacteria in, in the vagina and some like lactobacillus, and that helps prevent infections. So um, spermicides, douching, those can eliminate the good bacteria. Taking too many antibiotics can eliminate the good bacteria, which allows the bad bacteria to come in and cause these symptomatic infections. Um, another thing that makes uh, bacteria able to adhere is hormones. So um, unfortunately, as women age, our tissues <laughs> become less healthy they're drier, they're more fragile and thin, and that allows the bacteria to adhere better. The urethra can often become more open. And again, that makes it so that it's um, bacteria more easily enters the urethra. Um, and so that's something to consider in postmenopausal women. Um, there have been studies that suggest that you're more prone to developing um, an infection at certain points points in your uh, menstrual cycle. Um, and so that's something to consider as well. So step two of an infection is internalization. So once the bacteria get into the bladder and, and bind to the wall, they can actually enter the cells. And that is what makes it really hard to treat infections because once the bacteria get into our bladder cells, they're now protected from our immune system. Our immune system cannot attack our own bladder cells. And so it's no longer effective at treating you. Now that's when um, you really need antibiotics to, to, to get rid of the infection. And so that can, um, in, in some cases, it can take just a matter of hours, six to eight hours to create something that's called a biofilm. And so what they do is they bind together within your cells and it makes it again, it protects the bacteria from being treated. Um, and so it increases um, their resistance to certain, to certain antibiotics because some, um, some are not dissolved into the bloodstream in the same way. For instance, macrobid is really only good for treating infections within the bladder. Um, and that allows them to disseminate into the bloodstream more easily as well. So the most common bacteria, as I kind of alluded to earlier, that cause urinary tract infections are E. coli. And we call these uropathi uropathogenic E. coli. And they account for a significant proportion of infections in the community. Um, they have multiple factors that make them um, successful at causing these infections and uh, harder for our bodies to eliminate them naturally. Other bacteria that are uh, common causing urinary tract infections, Klebsiella, Enterococcus, Group B strep, Proteus, and Staph, sapr Staph saprophyticus. Something to note, if you have an infection like Proteus, that actually can make you cause kidney or form kidney stones as well. So not only do bacteria cause you to feel sick, uh, have these symptoms that are bothersome, they can make you become septic, but they can also cause you to have kidney stones. So our natural defenses to prevent infections. Again, I've talked about this already, but our natural flora, the more healthy bacteria we have on our body, the less likely we are to have unhealthy bacteria or this virulent bacteria. Um, there are things within your urine that make it um, so it's a uh, less uh, it's not as healthy of an environment for bacteria to grow in or a more hostile environment for bacteria. Um, your immune system is important, which is why immunocompromised patients are uh, more prone to getting infections, but also we consider them more complex to treat. And then exfoliation. So, you know, if there's bacteria on your skin and you clean it off, that, that helps get rid of them. So how do we treat infections? Well, for an un uncomplicated urinary tract infection, the first line treatment would be nitrofurantoin. You take it for five days, phosphomycin, that's a great antibiotic. It's a packet you get, you take it, it's a three-day treatment, but it's only taken once, or Bactrim, um, unfortunately has sulfa in it, and that's for three days. 
Those are the most preferred because those that are less absorbed within the body are into the gut. So they're not going to affect your gut bacteria in the same way. We want to, again, preserve all the good bacteria, get rid of all the bad bacteria. Um, second line treatments are the Cipro and Leviquin um, uh, that we see. When it's a more complicated patient or a complicated UTI, usually treatment's extended. So it's not three to five days, but it's a seven day treatment or uh, up to 14 days. And that's when we start using our Cipro, um, Leviquin, or the, that is, sorry, Bactrim as well. But most importantly, we should always use our local antibiogram. So what is that? That's something that every hospital needs to have to be accredited. And what they need to do is they look at all the bacteria that the patients in the community have come through and had, and they look at their resistance patterns for all of those bacteria, and they come up with a report, and they tell us as physicians what antibiotics work best. So for instance, this is Barton's antibiogram, um, and this is for organisms that are more common to be causing urinary tract infections. So you can see the list of bacteria here and then the different antibiotics. And then what we see, let's see. So we've talked about, or I've talked about E. coli a lot. So if we come across here, we can say, okay, well, if I were to give you augmentin, 89% of the bacteria are gonna respond to it. That's a pretty good option. If I were to give um, urtapenum, which this is a big gun, this is reserved for those resistant infections, 100% are gonna respond to them. Um, and so this helps make sure that we're giving the best antibiotics for our community as well. So what about bacterial persistence? So this means that you had a urinary tract infection, we treated it. For some reason, we got another culture, though I don't typically recommend that. And we get a, it comes back. Um, and so there, that's a reason that we need to do more of an investigation. So we have to see, is there a reason why this bacteria remained within your system? Um, there's a difference between uh, a recurrence and a persistence. Persistence means that maybe it never truly went away. So is there a stone that's super infected that I need to go and treat? Is it that... Um, you're, you have an anatomical abnormality. Maybe your kidney isn't draining well to your bladder. So that may be a reason for me to do further workup, whether it's getting a CAT scan to look at your anatomy or an ultrasound of your kidneys, or for me to do a cystoscopy. And that's to look in the bladder and make sure that there's not a bladder tumor there that's infected. Um, so that, that's when we start thinking about uh, or when a urologist really needs to be involved. So as I mentioned, uh, causes of persistence, so stones, um, you may have a kidney that didn't uh, thrive throughout your life. And so it's really small and doesn't function, but there's some urine stuck there that's infected. Um, there are some patients whose bladders don't empty well. And for some reason you get an outpouching called a diverticula. Again, urine gets stuck there and that urine that's stuck or not moving that just allows bacteria to grow. Um, so these are some of the things that I'm looking for when I see patients who really can't get rid of an infection. So what about asymptomatic bacteria, urea? So this is why I don't typically recommend checking for a cure. If you have an infection and you feel better after your treatment for your infection, then from my standard standpoint, there's nothing else to be done. We've taken care of the situation. You are no longer symptomatic. And for all intents and purposes, we use the correct antibiotic and you should be feeling better. If we check and you have no symptoms and there's still bacteria there, my co concern is, are we now going to be treating asymptomatic bacteria? I had a patient I saw recently who's been treated with antibiotics four times this year. She's not had symptoms any time, but she keeps getting checked for cure. So she's been getting multiple antibiotic doses when it's really not indicated. So again, this is when you have infection in your urine or bacteria, excuse me, in your urine for women in two samples and men for one sample. Um, and what studies have actually shown is that you do not need to treat these. And if you do treat these, that those patients who are treated are more prone to getting 
more infections with the more virulent strains. So then they do end up getting a symptomatic urinary tract infection because again, you're, you're affecting those natural host factors that defend you. So you're getting, anytime you take antibiotic, you're putting your body at risk of losing the good bacteria in your body. Catheter associated urinary tract infections. So again, you have an indwelling uh, foreign body. So that does make you more prone to having infections. Um, I talk to patients who need catheters that go both through the urethra, but also through the belly. I call that a super pubic catheter. Both have the same risk of infection. Um, so it doesn't matter where the catheter is. Um, and that, again, I only treat if a patient is symptomatic. Um, I don't typically go off of the smell of urine. I don't go off of the color of urine, but if you start to have pain or spasms, um, and then again, anytime you're altered, that's when we need to start treating you for infections. So a fever, again, that tenderness there, and then signs of pyelonephritis, that's when we need to treat you. So in terms of recurrence in women, um, this does increase as we age. In fact, young or baby boys are more prone to getting a urinary tract infections than girls for the first year of life. That's because, especially if they're not circumcised, they're at a little bit of an increased risk, but that swaps as the, after the kiddos turn one year old, one year old. So the risk of infection in the school age children is about 1%. And as we age, uh, by when we become young adults, it's 4%, and that increases uh, each decade. Um, as we become sexually active, that makes you more prone to developing infections. And then once we get to be elderly, um, that, that risk can get up to 15 to 50%. Um, and those factors, uh, menopause, diabetes, um, again, genetic susceptibilities that we talked about behaviors. So again, we're starting to engage in sexual intercourse as we get older and just anatomy. Um, unfortunately, as we age, we're prone to developing more medical conditions that may cause us to become immunocompromised. So what is it about me uh, menopause that makes us more prone to infections? Again, it's that low estrogen state. Um, it causes that decrease in the lactobacillus. Um, that lactobacillus uh, makes it so that there's lactic acid and hydrogen peroxide in the vaginal area. That acidity um, is bactericidal. It helps prevent bacteria from growing. Um, they also have been shown to prevent the bacteria from, be from being able to bind to surfaces. So as we lose that colony, as we age, that makes us more prone to infections. Um, postmenopausal women who have infections are more likely to have incontinence. They may have a cystocele, which is where your bladder kind of drops into your vagina or prolapse. And then they may also have an elevated postvoid residual or meaning they don't, you don't empty your bladder well. So there's urine left every time you pee. Again, that urine that's left over allows the bacteria to continue to grow. Diabetics. So um, risks from them. Again, they're immunocompromised. They, as your diabetes becomes less controlled or you've had it for a long time, unfortunately it can affect your bladder muscle and it can make it so that you can't empty your bladder as well. So that incomplete emptying, um, can really affect you and make you be more prone to infections that impaired immune system. Um, and diabetics are more likely to have resistant pathogens. Um, they can have uh, more aggressive pathogens and they can become more sick. And so more likely to have worse clinical outcomes. Uh, sometimes we do talk about how glucose spills into the urine and you can see that on urine tests. And some people have thought that maybe that's what, uh, promotes urinary tract infections. And there's no studies that really support that data. Um, again, women who have recurrent urinary tract infections, there is some genetic susceptibility and they are more likely to have a female family history with recurrent urinary tract infections as well. So as I alluded to again before about intercourse, so sexual activity increases your risk for urinary tract infections more so um, in older patients, but um, the more frequent you're having intercourse, 
the higher the likelihood of you becoming infected with the UTI. Um, diaphragm use puts you at risk of infections. Again, spermicide use uh, puts you at risk and new partners. And honestly, some of that is just mechanics. Um, unfortunately, there are bacteria in our vagina and the motion can allow them to get into your urethra and then colonize you that way. Things that don't cause infections. So obviously I'm not telling people not to shower and not be clean, but there's nothing to say that you need to go and shower every time you go to the bathroom. You don't need to use a bidet every time you go to the bathroom or a peri bottle. Um, hot tub use has not been associated with urinary tract infections. I've had patients tell me, oh, I don't take baths because they're going to give me infections. That's not true. Um, you know, if you're going to the bathroom very frequently, um, that, that doesn't prevent infections. Um, wiping patterns, they don't prevent infections. So I still would encourage people to wipe from front to back. Um, tampon use not associated with infections. And then, um, you know, people classically say you should wear cotton undergarments. And again, no studies have shown that they cause an increased risk of infections if you don't do those things or do, uh, depending on it. So what do I do when you come into my office and you're there for a recurrent urinary tract infection evaluation? Well, first of all, I go through your chart and I make sure you have recurrent urinary tract infections because I'd say 50%, maybe more patients who think they're there for that don't have them. Um, but I'm going to first just talk to you about your symptoms. I need to know what your symptoms are when you have those infections. I need to determine, is there something that's causing it? So for instance, do you have air or bubbles in your urine? Do you see brown flecks in your urine? Have you had multiple bowel infections before? Have you had surgery in your pelvis before? Have you had radiation? Those are all things that make you prone to developing something like a fistula that could be causing you to have recurrent infections. And so that's why I ask those questions to better understand, is there an anatomic uh, etiology that's underlying all of this? Um, Again, sometimes I may consider a cystoscopy that is not recommended by the AUA guidelines as a first step in uh, most patients who come in with recurrent urinary tract infections, but if you've had a previous bladder outlet surgery, and then for men with urinary tract infections, it often is recommended. And then for upper tract imaging, so are you re getting recurrent pyelonephritis? Then I really need to get a CAT scan, make sure that there's nothing that's causing um, obstruction of urine from draining a stone that may be super infected. I need to figure out why this keeps happening. So this is kind of just a diagram of um, when you get infections, what kind of the tree should be. So, you know, we get that culture, we determine if you truly have an infection or not. If you do, you get your antibiotics. And then if you have multiple infections, then most likely you're gonna come and see me for a uro urologic evaluation. If you're not getting uh, repeated infections, then you probably don't need to see me. Um, you don't have to waste your time waiting on me to possibly be late in my office. But um, if you have increased risk factors, then it may be worth a trip to, to the urology office. Um, if it's related to intercourse, oftentimes we can treat that with just one pill after sex. Um, so, you know, pay attention to what you think might be starting your infections, and that helps us as clinicians treat you appropriately. So things that um, do help prevent infections, number one thing is drinking lots of water. You drink water, it's going to flush out your system. Bacteria aren't going to be able to overgrow as well. Um, so really, the Urologic Associate AUA recommends two to three liters in a day. Um, sexual practices, you want to avoid spermicides. Um, you want to go to the bathroom and pee after having intercourse or engaging in intercourse. Um, and you want to essentially eliminate the possibility that you're holding urine all day long, that po elevated post void residual or that urine that's just stuck in your bladder, that's not moving. That's where bacteria are going to continue to grow. So what are treatments that we can do? So I'm sure anybody who's been to my office and my staff can tell you that I give vaginal estrogen out like candy. Any woman who's postmenopausal. Um, estrogen cream, it's a, just a topical that you use, has been prone or proven to prevent urinary tract infections in postmenopausal women. 
And again, because it improves the health of the vaginal area, it improves the health of the urethra, it makes it so the urethra may be more robust to prevent the bacteria from going in. And it can help with other things like um, uncomfortable intercourse, stuff like that. Um, there's some debate on whether or not probiotics can truly help prevent infections. Um, I don't necessarily recommend that to all my patients, so I don't think that it's a harmful thing to do. Um, cranberry extracts have been shown to, um, to help prevent infections. I guess I should move on my slides because I'm going to talk about all these. So sorry. <laughs> all right. So sorry for double talking about everything. So I should move along in my PowerPoint here. Um, so again, for vaginal estrogen cream, there have been, uh, um, two randomized trials that have shown that it uh, has improved the infection free rate and increased the amount of time that it would take to get an infection. It does take some time for it to be effective. So it takes about three months for you to see any improvement. So you're not going to see changes after doing it for a week. You only use it two nights a week. Um, so it just, it takes time for your, your body to adjust to it and to respond. Um, again, it also treats this, uh, something called the GU syndrome of menopause. So in addition to preventing infections, it can prevent overactive bladder symptoms. It can help reduce incontinence and it can help with pain with intercourse. Um, studies have looked at oral estrogen and it does not help prevent urinary tract infections. And then something, um, just a note about vaginal estrogen cream is the amount of estrogen that goes into the bloodstream is so negligible. Um, so it actually has now been shown possibly be safe for patients who have a history of breast cancer. So again, probiotics. Um, I don't know that there's really any robust data regarding probiotics. Uh, again, I, you know, having healthy bacteria helps prevent infections. So um, intellectually, it makes sense to me. Um, but uh, it's not something that I would tell you to go and buy from the store. Cranberry extract, there have been studies that have shown that cranberry extract can prevent uh, certain strains of bacteria. Um, and that has to do with those uh, adherence factors, the, the P fimbrae um, that help those uh, the uh, E. coli bacteria adhere to the, to the bladder wall. When you're looking at your cranberry extract, so one, Concentrate and juices have been not been shown to be sufficient. Uh, we can't measure the amount of active uh, uh, the pro and an anthocyanidines um, in them or the PACs. So when I talk to patients about it, you want it to have 36 PAC, and that's what's bioavailable um, to prevent the bacteria from or the infection from occurring. Um, there is one uh, urolo urologist who studies the different brands of cranberry extract across that are um, available or commercially available. And Allura brand is the one that is found to have the most bioavailable cranberry extract. I do not own stock in that company. I just recommend it because it's found to be the most effective. Costco does sell one that also has 36 PAC. So I imagine it's cheaper, um, but I just throw that out there. Um, methanamine salts. So this is called Hiprex. Um, and this is a, a prescription that I can give to patients. And essentially what happens is it changes your urine to be formaldehyde and ammonia. And that's bacteriostatic, meaning that it prevents bacteria from, um, from reproducing or growing. It does not kill bacteria. Um, there are very few side effects to it. We do need to monitor um, patients' liver enzymes if we do give it to you. Um, in the US, there's not that much data that shows that it's um, effective, though I think most urologists offer it to patients. But um, in the past year, the European Association of Urology has actually started recommending it. And one study just came out of Europe that shows that it does prevent a certain strain of infections or of, excuse me, of antibacteria. So again, um, I think this is kind of one of those up and coming medications. It's been around for a while, but I think it's getting um, more hype and maybe we'll learn more about how it could be uh, um, helpful in preventing infections. And then of course we have antibiotics. Um, so antibiotic prophylaxis or suppression are options uh, that you can give to patients. So um, antibiotic 
prophylaxis is what we do to prevent infections. So that's when you take um, a small, low dose of antibiotics um, to prevent urinary tract or to prevent UTIs from happening. And su suppression is when we prevent the growth that's already there. So that's when we're treating a symptomatic infection. Um, I tell every patient that this is not my first line therapy, that I like you to try conservative measures first, that we need to track how many infections you've gotten. And then if you're having recurrent infections and I can prove them with cultures, then yes, we go to this. Um, there are three different regimens that exist. Uh, the low dose continuous prophylaxis, a self-start therapy and post intercourse prophylaxis. So the low dose continuous prophylaxis is where um, you may take a half dose of a common antibiotic um, or a lower dose and you take it on a daily basis. Again, we want to use antibiotics that don't affect the gut flora so much because we don't want to get rid of good bacteria. The main risk with this is that you're going to develop resistance or there's a risk of developing resistance to these antibiotics, meaning that they're a non-option for you in the future. Um, usually we will only do it for six months and see if you, and then take you off of it and see how you do. Um, it's, in my opinion, pretty crummy to take a young woman and put her on antibiotics for the rest of her life. That's not really a good option. Um, so you have to trial off of it and see how you do. And if the infections come back, then we have a conversation and we can consider doing it again. Um, sorry, my dog is not the most. Um, so then we have self-start therapy. Uh, and that's for patients who have had multiple infections. They have the same, my dog's not going to stop. I apologize. The same symptoms every time they have infections. And so we give you maybe 30 pills of an antibiotic and say, okay, at the start, at, at the onset of your symptoms, start taking the antibiotics, but still you should drop off a culture before you start them. Uh, that way we can make sure that we're not just treating um, nothing, but you have the antibiotics to start yourself. And that works well for a lot of people who have recurrent infections. That way you're not on that continuous prophylaxis. And then the last is oh, post intercourse antibiotic prophylaxis. And that's only for patients who notice that their infections are associated with sexual intercourse uh, every single time they get it. And for those patients, I give you an antibiotic, you take one pill after having sex, and then hopefully that prevents your infections. Now I did have a patient who I did that for once and she literally had sex every day. So I don't know that that counts. That's taking it every single day. Um, but that is an option for some patients. Um, so what about this recurrent cystitis? And this is a, <laughs> I was talking with my MA earlier. She's like, oh, everybody's going to be really excited about this part. And that's probably because I talk about it all day, every day. Because for those 50 to 70% of patients who don't have infections, but you have all of those symptoms, what about it? How is that happening? And that is from, oftentimes from chronic pelvic pain. So your, your pelvis has muscles in it that support your bladder, your uterus, your rectum. Um, and those muscles can carry tension just like muscles in your back. Just like you can throw out the muscles in your back and have significant back pain, you can throw out the muscles in your pelvis, and it can manifest itself in different ways. You can have overactive bladder, you can have burning when you pee, you can have urgency and frequency, and in some male patients, you can have testicular pain. Um, and these patients will check for urinary tract infections, will check for sexually transmitted infections, and everything comes back as negative. So how do we treat that? Well, this is obviously the hardest thing to treat because really this is, co this comes down to stress and tension in your body and stress management is important for all of us, but we live in a really stressful world. So, um, really hard to, to relax and, and, you know, get away and find a way to release, uh, you know, those things that are weighing on you, but it's important. Um, I'm like the biggest fan of pelvic floor physical therapy. I know Audra and Brie gave a lecture maybe a year ago about what they do in pelvic floor PT. And most patients who come from through my office will at some point probably end up with a referral there. Um, we do not understand those muscles as humans that are in our pelvis, because I mean, when do you use it when you have to pee and you're in the car and you can't make it to the bathroom? Otherwise we never think about them. So if you don't think about those muscles, you don't think that they might be tense all the time. 
So they can help teach, teach you to understand how you're using those muscles. If they're tense, are they relaxed? Um, and I think it's really important. I think everybody in the world should go to pelvic floor physical therapy at least once or twice. Um, your Kegel exercises. So again, we usually think about that in terms of trying to prevent yourself from peeing or from leaking urine for women who have had, had babies. Um, you want to do these a different way if you're having the syndrome of pain. You want to just squeeze for a second and really try and relax those muscles. So squeeze one and then relax for three seconds. And you do those quickly. So 20 reps three times a day. Uh, and then sits baths, soaking in a tub if you're able to get in and out of the tub to relax those pelvic floor muscles. So that way, again, we're relieving that tension and it's not transmitting into the bladder, causing that, un that discomfort. Um, so what are my conclusions? Um, uncomplicated urinary tract infections can be treated with a short dose of antibiotics. Um, that rare, recurrent urinary tract infections are common in women, but it's really important that we check cultures. And while there are some methods that we have to try and prevent those infections from occurring, um, ultimately, if you're having really bad infections, yes, antibiotics are the best way to treat them. We just need to make sure we're treating the right thing. Um, and so uh, oftentimes I cannot find a reason for your infection. So I know some patients come in to my office and they think that I'm going to save your world and you're never going to get an infection again. And unfortunately, that's not reality. Reality is I can help guide you and give you methods to try and prevent them. And I can treat them when they happen. But a lot of times I can't find a reason for it. It may be genetic. It may be anatomical. Um, and, but there's not much that I can really do. And then vaginal estrogen cream for every postmenopausal woman. Um, we should all be on it. Um, and then any questions? That is my dog who just decided to bark through half of my presentation. Wanted to be part of the presentation. It actually, it wasn't too distracting on my end. So hopefully that's <laughs> the case for everyone else. Um, there are some questions that are coming in and just as a reminder, you are welcome to ask questions in the Q and a box. Um, there is an anonymous question or option to ask or in the chat. Um, and if you have questions outside of, um, this specific topic, I'm sure, um, Dr. Locke would be happy to answer those too. Um, the first one, I think you did mention that at the end, but can you repeat the name of the one, the one pill that, um, you suggested to take after, um, intercourse? Oh, uh, so, you know, it depends. So if you're taking an over the counter medicine, you can take cranberry extract. You can take one or two after intercourse. And they suggest that that might prevent infection, but it would be something that you would need to see either your primary care doctor or me. And we would probably give you an, a prescription for macrobid or some antibiotic, um, depending to, to prevent infection. Mm -hmm. Okay. The next question is, um, as primary care providers, should we start prophylaxis after recurrent UTI or refer? Um, honestly, I really think that's up to you and your comfort with it. Um, if you do start prophylaxis, I, I do strongly recommend having a plan to stop it. Um, I think that if it's a young woman who is Again, if it's a young woman who's having an associate with intercourse, by all means, I don't think you need to send that patient to me. I think you can totally manage that. If it's a more complicated patient, then I think there's no harm in sending that patient my way. I'm happy to see them. Okay, great. The next question um, asks, can wearing sanitary pads 24 seven due to incontinence cause recurrent infections? Also, what would you recommend a senior female do if she gets recurrent infections and has been given antibiotics a few times a year for the past few years? Does she need a specialist at this point? Sure. So sorry, two questions there. Yeah. So, you know, sanitary pads, I think the issue with them that might make you a little bit more prone to infection is how often you change them. So if you're wearing a pad until it's soaked and wet, then that may make you more prone to them. But obviously the whole point of a pad is it's meant to be absorbent and keep you dry. So if you're not, um, a, you know, if you're able to change the pads once they've reached their maximum absorbency, um, then I don't think that would put you at increased risk. 
But that moist environment, that is an environment that allows bacteria to grow. Um, in terms of uh, being a, a wise woman and getting bacteria uh, or infections a couple of times a year and being treated with antibiotics, um, again, I definitely recommend estrogen cream if you're not already on it. You just put a little bit on your finger inside your vagina and on your urethra two nights a week. Um, and while that may feel, be a little bit uncomfortable for some women to do, um, the benefits from it, I think will help with that incontinence. It will help prevent those infections. If you're still sexually active, it may improve your sex life. So I really think that that could help. Um, and then, you know, making sure if you're concerned that you're not emptying your bladder, it, it's probably time to be evaluated by a urologist, because if you're leaking urine, um, you know, we just need to make sure that you're not retaining that. Maybe you don't have prolapse of your bladder and that's contributing to things. Great. There's another question. What's the dose of vaginal estrogen for people with estrogen sensitive cancer or a history of cancer? Yeah. So, um, the, the dose is, uh, so it's 0.4286 grams per milliliter. And again, it's a pea sized amount. I don't make a difference in dosage based on your cancer history or not, because again, the amount that's absorbed into your bloodstream is so negligible. It's only two, two times a week there. So, um, you know, you can always confirm with your oncologist I think that it's safe. Um, you know, some oncologists may say, you know, give you the it's probably fine, but we'll never know. But I, there have been a lot of studies now. I think that I, I attended a webinar recently on um, estrogen and, and postmenopausal women. And I think there have been something like 16 studies have shown that it's safe in women with estrogen related cancers. Okay. Um, and this looks like it might be the last question. So if you have a question you want to get in now is the time. Um, but this question was about, would you recommend, or could you recommend the brand of, uh, estrogen cream you just mentioned? Oh, so it's prescribed by, um, physicians. So there's estrays, Premarin, but really I would say the brand, uh, is most important or the most important thing is your insurance company and what it will cover. Um, so I found that most insurance companies here in South Lake Tahoe cover estrays. Um, but it is a prescription medication, at least in the United States. Okay. And it looks like one more snuck in. Um, do you ever prescribe the Floxin antibiotic for uh, um, UTIs? I've heard there's some dangerous side effects. Yes. So, um, you know, urologists love our fluoroquinolones or the ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, um, it does have a black box warning that it can cause tendon rupture. So, um, a lot of us started to shy away from it when that warning came out, I will still prescribe it for patients. I do typically tell patients that there's a risk of tendon rupture, that if you're going to do significant exercise, you need to warm up your body really well. Um, but yes, I do. Um, just like other antibiotics also have serious significant side effects. Um, but that's the reason why I try to avoid an antibiotics unless you truly have an infection. Okay. And there's a couple more that snuck in. So this is a great, good conversation. Um, the question is, is it okay to use a water-based KY jelly for vaginal dryness? Um, for, yeah, that's fine. I don't think that there's any difference between the different types of lubricants in terms of your overall vaginal health. Um, none of them affect your risk of infections more than another that I'm aware of. Um, so whatever makes the experience the most exciting for you. And there's also a comment about taking D manose daily uh, seems to help. Yes. Sorry. I thought that I had a slide on it and I didn't. So D manose, and I had talked about it earlier is another supplement that has been shown to possibly help prevent infections. And I had talked about those d receptors with those um, adherence factors. So the idea is that it prevents the bacteria from adhering in the first place. And so then that prevents the, the development of that infection and the internalization. 
So I do often recommend D mannose to patients as something to consider. Um, obviously every time I recommend all these supplements, I understand that supplements are not cheap either. Um, so, you know, some of the supplements that have truly been shown to prevent infections, cranberry has evidence, uh, based data behind it. Uh, D mannose does not have the same evidence though. Again, a lot of urologists recommend it. We can intellectualize it with the science behind it, but we haven't found the studies that prove it. Excellent. Um, there was a, just the last question about whether this was recorded. It is, it was recorded. Um, we'll have it available on our YouTube channel, um, pretty quickly here. You can also review it on our Facebook page if you have access to that. Um, but I think that concludes all the questions. I'm just looking one last time and Dr. Locke, we really appreciate you being here tonight. Um, there'll be a quick survey, um, that's going to be offered to you at the conclusion of tonight's presentation. We love hearing your feedback, how we did. And, um, if you have any, um, future topics you'd like us to address in the future, but I think with that, we'll sign off and thank you again. I hope you have a great evening and thanks Dr. Locke for joining us tonight. We appreciate it. Thank you.